All right, good afternoon. We're going to present this afternoon on more specifics of the mild and moderate programming. There will be a little bit of review from my morning topic because there's the overlap uh, between the two for me is exactly the reason why I decided to go and, and delve into mild and moderate parental alienation. So following me will be Chris Turner, and then following Chris will be Jennifer to kind of give us all the research perspective and wrap it all up. So as I mentioned this morning, you know, my rationale for studying mild and moderate parental alienation was so little has been done. We really don't understand what it really means, you know, in the bigger picture. We have a much more in-depth understanding of what severe parental alienation is at this point. But I think our one of our best uses of our time and energy can be to intervene much earlier in the process and try and prevent some of these families from escalating and or capture them earlier uh, when they're on their way to escalating and maybe trying to reroute them so that they don't end up in the severe end of the, of the spectrum. So using what Bill has, has presented here in Philadelphia this, this time, we took our definition of mild and moderate from the work that came out in the Lorandos and Sober and, and Burnett book, the 2013 book is where they defined this. And we decided that that's going to be our operating definition at this point and it's subject to change as more research is produced and we understand that but for mild the child does resist but once the child is in the care of the target parent settles down they have their time together with relatively few bumps the moderate child resists but doesn't settle down if at all and that's the child that continues to be disruptive while in the care of the target parent and continues to act out and continues to have ongoing contact and communication with the favored parent, which just furthers the disruption during the target parent's parenting time. So what we think is important is to understand the continuum. And as I discussed earlier this morning, some of our research goals are very specific. We're using some instruments that some are just designed or have been used exclusively in the research community. Some of the instruments that I'm familiar with coming from a clinical background, we've modified and are using and actually have standardized and psychometrically normed statistical tables for them. So we have cutoff scores and we have all the variability and reliability quotients and I mean, you know, it just goes on and on and on, you know, the psychometrics behind them. So we are measuring many, many things in order to promote the research, but we're also concurrently, Chris will talk about this, we have put together some programming for mild and moderate children. It, it's a first attempt. It's, um, you know, the first out of the gates approach, drawing on the science and research that we have right now, which is the severe research. So. We're having to extrapolate and make inferences and and do some things that may or may not come to fruition once we fill in some of the gaps with our research understanding. But we're giving it our best shot at this point based on what we know and the understanding that we have of the research at this time. But we want to understand what it is about these families early on and which ones take a route to further destruction and which ones don't. And Chris is the one, as I, as I alluded to this, this morning, she does the pro se meet family mediations. Those are the families that don't want to fight. Understanding what is so different about them psychologically, uh, dynamically, cognitively uh, is important because if we can capture some of those, those um, traits and factors in those families, it helps us understand why families don't necessarily want to uh, prevent the fighting. It's not that families want to fight. I, let me just reframe that. Families don't necessarily want to fight, but they get so distorted in their, their thinking, and the legal system takes them down a very, very different adversarial path. And they're, if you're vulnerable in ways that we hope to understand, 
then you're more susceptible to being influenced by an adversarial legal system. And if we could learn how to prevent parental alienation, that would be a very lofty goal, but you know, step by step, increments. So intervening much earlier to prevent the escalation, providing evidence-based information to family law courts as they make decisions concerning custody and access. Very important, our, our family law courts are gonna be here. I don't see any movement to disband them and do away with them. And judges, in my experience, in the 15 years I did custody evaluations, do want to do the right thing. Uh, they have a hard time sorting through science and research. And they have a, a hard time understanding all the contradictions that we know and, and that we, are, we hear when we delve into this, this field. They get tripped up by the same contradictions. And they don't understand the research behind children who are abused and how that these children still want relationships with their family and their parents. They just don't want the abuse anymore. You know, they want the abuse to stop, but they want those relationships. It's, it's so contradictory. It's very, very difficult. And when you're in an adversarial system, there's so much other information that gets convoluted and thrown into the mix, and it's hard for the judges to sort through everything, but they do want to do the right thing. And taking advantage of that uh, at least gets your foot in the door. And then ultimately assisting in policy changes. Uh, there are legislative changes in different jurisdictions, and there, people have different thoughts on that. Some people have promoted to Chris and I that they want to approach this from the ground up like grassroots approach, and you know have the, the target parents just really create a coalition. And, and yes, um, I think I'm more of the opinion, let's go top down and make legislative changes, and just this is the law now, you know, and, and hand it to the courts and the family law attorneys, and this is just what you follow. Probably will take some of both. Okay, so this starts your slide. All right, so I'm going to let Chris describe the programs um, that we put together in the Houston area. We came together as a psychologist, and Chris went to law school, and I'll let her describe her own background to you, but we, we came together through a very, very severe parental alienation case, interestingly. So that's how we, we segued, and then we decided that we wanted to devote our time and attention to understanding and hopefully preventing and at least uh, offsetting at the much earlier end of the continuum. Thanks, Mary. So as Mary said, my name is Chris Turner, and I'm a mediator. And Mary and I got together because I was dealing with pro se cases, and everyone assumes that those pro se cases come to family mediation because, without attorneys, because they don't have the money. And that's kind of the mindset that people have in our area. And that wasn't the case. I was getting multi-million dollar settlements um, in families that had their own businesses. And the key component I was, that was common to them was that they had children. And not only did they not want to lose all of the resources, they did not want to damage their children. Mary, on the other hand, was very much working with high conflict um, court cases where children were being torn apart. And we knew two different worlds in the same geographical area, in the same town, a small town. So it was really interesting for us to come together. And, and what led us to kind of this, uh, this program was to try to find out how do we get in front of this? How do we get to prevent this? We don't know what the continuum looks like. We don't know if mild is set aside, as she said earlier, or whether it's a continuum that, that these families are on that projectile and they're eventually going to be uh, severe regardless of what, what starts it. So that's part of our research. Um, but one of the things that I've learned very quickly in mediation is that the first thing that you need to do to get people to start talking when it's high conflict is to take the emotion out of it, right? Take a step back and work with the facts and get people talking. And that's kind of where we had that idea of resetting the family, which is the, the name of our program. And so, so we're getting them back, trying to get the emotion out of their conversations and get them back to that educational component. What do they need to know about their children? What do they need about their children's development? What do they need to know about what they're doing to their children from a research-based educational approach? Get them focused on that first. The other issues are very important. The therapy is important as well. But get them to have a common understanding of what the facts are and what the priorities are from a very non-judgmental, non 
emotional position. And so that's why we start with that educational approach and presentation, educating them about what's happening to their children, what's happening in their family, and also what could happen to their family as they move further down. Um, we, we chose families that exhibit the, the effects of a uh, mild to moderate parental alienation, as she said. And we opened our program to anyone that had influence on that family. So step parents, grandparents, anyone who was having a voice in continuing that conflict or putting that child in the middle, we encouraged them to come. Most of our cases initially were court ordered. And we have one case right now that we saw probably a year ago and the child looks completely different because they're still in litigation and he is getting sicker and sicker. Even though he's hearing what we're saying, even though he, their parents are, are very conscious of it, they're fighting in litigation. So um, we're focusing a lot on, on educating the, jur the jurisdictions in our area, but also on reaching out to therapists to teach them about what's happening to children so they can work with us and pair with us to do the family therapy as well. Um, so but we leave it open to anyone that's in that family system that might have an impact on making that, that successful and educating them as well. Um, we have a separate program for the adults, for the parents that we consider target parents or favored parents, and then a separate program for the children. So the children have a safe place to come. They're learning a little different skills. We're teaching the parents about what they're learning, same continuum, but on their level, developmentally appropriate. And those children that, that are in our program are 9 to 14, that, that age group, because we're teaching them critical thinking skills and they need to be in that position. Hopefully we'll add more on later on. But um, the three the components that we have in our program, so we do an intake. And the, well, I'll go through the kind of assessment we do with that intake. But at that point, we spend six hours. We have the mom and the child come in, or one parent and the child, children, child or children come in, any child, not just 9 through 14, but anyone that is involved in that family system and we do some testing and have some conversations with them and do some analysis and then we have the dad come in with the same group of children um, at separate times um, and fill out responses um, and even of you that are familiar with the bark the, the back in the park um, are familiar that you're asking questions about the mom when they're with the dad and the dad with the mom so it's important that they have that separation um, but that intake, that's at the point where we're screening things out. So if we think it's a mild case, it's something that we can basically say, look, do you see what you're doing? Here's what's happening in your family situation. Here's the pattern. And they have that aha moment. We're referring them to co-parenting classes that we've developed that also hit these target areas that we're talking about, but on a less intense program. Many times the parents are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was going on. And those are a lot of my pro se cases. They all have to go through that four-hour parent education program, which pretty much they're in crisis when it's going around on, or they're doing it online, and it doesn't stick. Um, and they don't realize you know, the co-parenting component of this. So we're refreshing that for those families that are mild. Um, and then the severe cases we're referring out. So we're, we're strictly staying with mild and moderate on that, on that continuum. No severe we're referring out to people that specialize in treating severe alienation cases. Um, the next step that we would go to is to have that intensive program. So for, um, and again, for the children as well as for the adults, is separate programs, but they are th uh, three full days, two days of the intensive program where they're doing everything, and we'll go through the steps that we're doing with them, um, and then a refresher course. So that, that we'll have the parent program part one, and then two weeks later, parent program part two, and then six weeks later, the refresher. And during that time, they have homework that we give them to work on. Things like, you know, asking them if, if, if the topic had been, um, you know, not erasing that parent or having not interfering with communication. How many times did you allow that child to call? Did your child, did you offer to share with the other parent who wasn't at that sporting activity the opportunity to say, hey, dad, I kicked a soccer goal today? Or is your picture, if it was a picture of your, the other parent in your home? Is he allowed to bring those things? Making them more aware and practicing some of those skills and breaking down those tactics at home. Um, then we do a post program. We're showing, doing the same evaluation that we did the pre that we're doing the post. So we're getting before and after. Um, and then we're following statistically up later with some of the same testing at 6, 12, and 24 months, possibly more later on, um, especially with our target groups. Okay, so um, many of the things that we're, we're doing during those instructions, um, as Mary said uh, earlier, the psychopathology is one thing that we're really looking for. Is there an underlying illness that has, in, has or has not been diagnosed. So a lot of the history we're getting, uh, one parent will say that the other parent is bipolar or is, you know, does have these 
uh, this diagnosis and the other parent won't. So we're getting some more definition about that and doing some testing for that. We're looking at power and control. Um, we're looking at autonomy, self-awareness scales, and self-control, self-care. Um, we're looking at observational. So we're doing an intake with both the parent present in the room with the child as well as a parent by themselves and the child by themselves, doing some observation of behaviors and communication between the family members during that time. And we're writing a narrative about that. We also take narratives from co ongoing conversations we might have with the courts, with an amicus that's involved, or other party members. Um, on the child, when we do the, and this is a testing we do both at pre and post. Um, uh, we're looking at the back in the park, you know, as, as our, uh, we're looking at uh, anxiety, we're looking at, um, we're using Powtoon videos now, and we're looking at uh, stress factors in the child. So a lot of those things, and at, at, there have been many times when I've said to Mary and, and Jennifer both, this is a lot of testing. Do we really need to do all of this? And we're doing this at the very beginning. We don't know what we're going to need as time goes on, so we're gathering as much data as we can now. There's specific questions that we're wanting to answer now, but we want to be able to capture that data now. And the parents don't seem to mind um, you know, participating in that. All right, so um, our parent program as I said, is those three half-day intensives, the two intensive days, and then the one um, refresher course. They're doing a lot of educational uh, assessments, self-assessments. We're doing role plays. We're showing them videos. They have the opportunity to interact with one another. Many times, both parents are in the same class, and they're interacting, and they're role playing. And um, we've made, had the opportunity, because we've done the intakes with them, to target maybe some of the behaviors they're using, give them a role play that specifically targets that behavior. The same thing with the child and how he reacts to that. Um, and all of what we're doing is focusing on what's the impact on your child. You know, we're, we're very aware of what we're asking them to be aware of in terms of their own self-care. Are you deteriorating in this process as well? But what is this doing to your child? That is our primary focus. Um, and what's, what's happening with their brain development through, as a result of this and ongoing um, neurological and ongoing physical issues that may come up. On the children's program, we started with three half days and we're finding that, especially with some of our children, the anxiety levels are so high, we're probably going to go to four two-hour days, you know, two-hour sessions, because it's just too much for them to impact. Um, but it is uh, educational as well. We're doing a lot of perception um, versus reality. We're doing a lot of using a lot of the same tools that we have with them, using funnier cartoons and videos that that show a point, um, using um, role playing a lot as well, um, getting them to put their critical thinking back on on task. You know, really taking a look at what is and what is, and what do they know to be true versus what have they been told, and not necessarily answering those questions and outing a parent, but getting them to start thinking through the process of what they know um, and what their perception is, and making sure that they understand that there are two sides to every story. Um, and, you know, things that we would say to them, for example, are, um, you know, what could be the possible reason why that woman is crying? We'll show them a picture of a woman crying. What are the possible reasons? And we'll get a whole list of things. So it gets them thinking, what I see is not necessarily what the, the canned answer or the assumption was in the past, and getting them to think outside the box again and get those critical thinking skills back on target. <clears throat> Okay, so the key factors that we're looking for, we have two core groups, the, the group of parents that's on, in the mild and moderate classes, um, in the alienation classes, so we're looking for pathology, the impact on the child, child, the power and balance between the parents, and is that is that even, is it equal? You know, one of the questions that came up is, are we equal in the amount that we alienate each other from the child, you know, or is, and is that the case in most mild to moderate, or is there a, a power imbalance there in terms of not only use of the child as a tool, but, but of all of the assets of the relationship as well. And the role in litigation, um, that's one thing we really have to be very, very cautious of. We have a lot of contact with the ongoing litigation, um, and again, we're finding that to be counterproductive to what we're doing many times. Um, on our pro se cases, so we have about 40 cases that we're using to start with. They do the same intake procedures. They're filling out the same kind of um, paperwork we have. I have their intakes from when they first came to mediation. So even cases that are four years old, I'm able to look back and see what the history of that is. Um, we're looking at the recidivism in the court system. So those cases that were pro se that came to us that settled, have they ever gone back to court again? What was the issue? Was it just a support issue or was there an issue with the child? And that will tell us a little bit more about whether or not there has been some more bashing of, a, of another parent or whether there's cause for that or whether there's 
is, is, is does alienation happen post divorce and post poor settlement that, that is uh, we need to look further at. And we're looking at the child's adjustment at post divorce and what their family relationships are. Do they still have contact with all of all of the uh, both parents equally and um, developmentally appropriate contact? And so we're looking at, at a lot of those factors. Um, and then Mary, so Jennifer's going to talk to you a little about what kind of questions we're answering for the research. Uh, my part's really quick here because we're collecting data. We don't have any fun results to report yet. Um, but you can see all the battery of measures, which take quite a while for these parents to fill out repeatedly, and they're happy to do it. Um, they, they're willing. They're willing to do it, <laughs> um, and they contribute. They know that they're contributing to our understanding of family conflict and divorce and, and children. And um, one thing that I think maybe we could I could explain a little bit more is we're developing assessment tools of the children to get at their critical thinking in this context. Um, so. Um, Chris had mentioned use of Powtoon videos. If you've ever seen them, they're like mini animations that you can create online. It's a software. So I have um, some undergraduate students who've created scenarios um, illustrating a lot of um, what Amy Baker tactics. just left. Yeah, the tactics that alienating parents use. So we depict it, and then we're creating an assessment tool, uh, like vignettes that they see, and then an assessment tool that is interview with a psychologist with a child and asking them what's going on in the situation and the hope is by participating in this program the children will have a more nuanced or more kind of um, um, I guess more you know perspective taking that can happen by watching these videos over time by going through the program and not have this black and white thinking and you know kind of very um, rigid thinking about things um, and so we're developing that and I think that'll be a really useful assessment tool for others to use um, and we've also applied for a grant, let's hope we get it, uh, to, to assess um, biomarkers of stress among the children who are being alienated and compare them to kids in the pro se group who are not alienated um, by collecting, we're going to collect hopefully hair cortisol samples um, of the children, um, which isn't cheap. So if we don't get the grant, we're going to have to search somewhere else for the money to do it. But we think it's very important to bridge this gap between trauma and exposure and behavior and outcomes and showing some physiological responses in the kids. So we should find out about that by December. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, so all these, all these tools that we're doing, we're trying to look obviously for improvements over time. So are we seeing decreases in loneliness, increases in, or decreases in perceptions of hostility, uh, more equal kind of power dynamics with the parents that they can start to negotiate better and not misuse their power against each other. Um, which factors of personality factors and other things are contributing to improvements? Um, are these, if these cases are really doomed to continue on and become severe, what is, what's facilitating that? What's not? There's so many research questions we can ask with this data set that we're collecting. And I would love it if anybody else has clinical samples or anything and you want to use the same battery of stuff that we have, let's collaborate. My dream is to actually have a repository where you could upload data on your cases that are de-identified and tracked over time because that's the best way to collect as much data as we can because um, everybody's working individually. And if we can somehow pool all that, I think it's a very powerful way to, to answer a lot of research questions. So. If anybody has ideas, come and talk to me. I don't. Maybe there's a grant out there that'll let me do that. But, but we've been developing this. And if you even think of any other variables that we aren't measuring, tell us so we can throw it in there. You know, it's good to kind of. We don't want to add too much more, but at the same time, we don't want to miss any important constructs that you think might be important to look at and really understand how we can distinguish mild, moderate, severe, and how we can distinguish these families from other kinds of families. We don't. We won't know unless we measure it. So and we need good good um, constructs to get at that. Um, we've been doing this for a year, brainstorming and adding. I just I just added a loneliness measure after going to a conference this summer because I, there's a whole literature on loneliness and the impact on, um, you know, and we know a lot of alienated parents are isolated and, and um, been isolated because of the violent be or aggressive behaviors of the other parents. So um, so I think when we understand these differences, these, these data will help us do that. And we would love to have other people work with us on that too. So on that note, we're ending. We have about two minutes for questions. <laughs> so, yeah, or five minutes. Right? I think we go to two. So, yes?
Right. So. Can you hear me? No. No. Is that one on? No. No. <laughs> Here. Okay. Here, speaking up to the mic. Here. All right. So, so the pro se cases, um, the pro se groups that we have are people that have come to mediation uh, without attorneys that are pro se. That's a totally separate group. That's a, they haven't been identified as having any of the factors. They haven't been, come to us because the court said that their children are the basis of the family conflict or that they put their children in the middle of it. Um, and almost all of the um, cases that we have on the other side have attorneys involved. They're heavily in litigation or they've been in therapy because of the child-related issues, right? Correct, non-alienated families, right, exactly. And we're finding out if there are any of those factors as we go through the same testing that we do with the other, so they're our control group. What does a normal family look like, you know, a normal divorce family who's trying to get along versus a high conflict? We're trying to identify those factors. Yeah, so because it's a measure that captures um, exposure to stress hormones for three months or so, depending on how, how long of a sample you take, and it's pretty stable for fairly long, but a lot of kids have short hair, so you can't get, go back that far. Um, but we can't do change over time. In that case, you would, I mean, if you're looking at real-time change and stress, you have to do saliva and other types of uh, measures. Um, so we're just looking, we can only look at gr group comparisons, not change over time as a result of the intervention. But this is just the first kind of stab at it to see if there's anything there. Um, and so we would group together the mild and moderate. Well, first we'd probably group together all of the children that are in the intervention group. And as well as the kids who are not as part of the intervention. So they could be the 16-year-olds who aren't participating but are still in that family dynamic. And we could take samples from all of those children and then compare them to the children in the pro se cases and just see is there more stress for those folks than the ones that are not. Because um, the other ones are undergoing divorce too. So above and beyond that, are, are we seeing the stress of divorce? Is Are we seeing increases in stress because of the alienation that's going on above that? And so that, that's the intent. I mean, if we, can, if we can show, and if we can show that there's a difference, then we have justification for more money to funding to, to look at other markers, right? So you have to kind of lay the foundation first and then build. Right. Yes, if you're showing, yeah, yeah. Because toxic stress, you know, because you have different levels of stress. And when you get that toxic level of stress, the impact that that has on children's development is really severe early on. And if you can mitigate that early on, you can limit the damage to the brain and other parts of the body, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. We have, oh, no minutes. <laughs> um, uh, how about, yeah, we want to turn this over to the US. Um, so, and I think we have a break after that, so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be available after that for to answer other questions that you guys have. Okay, all right, sorry.